as part of our Wellness for Life program, we are having a series of lectures that have to do with health and wellness and taking care of yourself. And so Ed Robertson is one of our physical therapists down at Summit, and he is our shoe guru, as Allison has labeled him. He has a tremendous amount of experience in feet over the last few years and has kind of just fallen into this and has collected some shoes, as you can see. So he's going to present to us today on finding your soulmate. Um, reminder for everybody to sign into, and then I think we're going to send out surveys on Survey Monkey instead of how do you do it in paper. So welcome in. Thank you. The, uh, thanks, Carrie. Um, there is a handout. It looks like most of you have gotten one, but if you, does, if you don't have a handout, there's one on the back table. Just a little bit of information for you to take with you. Um, if, uh, you know, a month from now or when you go shoe shopping and you're standing in front of the wall of shoes, you're like, okay, now what did Ed say and what kind of foot do I have? And so hopefully the little handout might give you some, some reminders then so that you can make appropriate choices um, for yourself when you go shoe shopping. This is one of these things that just sort of evolved for me over, over time. Uh, um, I've really been kind of focusing on feet uh, and, and just sort of out of necessity. I was getting to where um, you know, half of my caseload, especially in the spring and summer, are runners uh, or even just people just trying to move more. And the best thing for business for me over the last decade has been the, the half marathon. That took... <laughs> That took Joe Average Bag of Donuts runner who, you know, or joggers that do their, you know, three miles a couple times a week, and they took, looked at that half marathon distance, and they thought, I can do that. Well, it turns out most of them can't. Um, and, and it's really not, not, it was really just errors in, either errors in training or errors in, in not getting the right shoe to match their foot. And uh, that marriage between your foot, your shoe, and the surface you're running on is really critical. And, and I got to where I was going with one patient at a time, having the same discussion and, and, and needing examples of, of the different kinds of shoes and footwear that's out there. That I just went to Big Five and went shopping, and I bought all these shoes. Um, I'm not a very smart man. I didn't buy a single pair in my size. And so these are all brand new. Uh, I can't wear any of them. Um, and so uh, today really is just sort of a culmination of, of uh, the discussions that I go through every, uh, virtually every day with a lot of my patients and trying to get um, uh, help them make the right choice when they go, go shoe shopping and, um, and helping them identify really what kind of foot they have. This is my favorite place to evaluate feet. Um, actually, I wish this was my clinic, but uh, this is actually Dorschach Reservoir, and, and those are not my feet. My feet are way too ugly for pictures. But um, um, one of the things, just as sort of a basic fundamental understanding of what we're asking our feet to do, I really defy the engineers at Schweitzer to try to come up with a machine that will perform opposite functions 5,000 times a day for 90 years, and for the most part work. Uh, pretty effectively and without problems for the majority of that time. Um, our feet have to do three things every time that foot hits the ground. It initially acts as a shock absorber uh, to attenuate force loads and dissipate impact. It has to adapt to the terrain and conform to whatever surface we're walking on. And then it has to transform from a shock absorber uh, and, and, and transform into a rigid lever so that we have something to push off of. Um, we run into problems when our feet don't do one of those things very well. Um, either we may not be very good at shock absorbing, we have a very stiff foot, it's a, it's a rigid lever all the time, uh, or it's always a shock absorber, it's a loose bag of bones that never really transforms to a rigid lever. And, and so that... Uh, uh, and, and it's not good to be all of one thing and not of another. You can imagine if you had a rigid lever all the time, this is, I mean, it's hard to shock absorb in a ski boot. You can't even walk cool in a ski boot. So <laughs> the, um, um, the, and adapting to the terrain, uh, you can imagine that, you know, how these feet have to function a little differently, a little higher level of demand uh, when you're barefoot walking on cobblestones, or even just if any of you have, 
gone chucker hunting that first time and walking the breaks of the Salmon River, um, man, you're, you're asking your feet to do something they're not used to doing. Um, but our feet have that capability, and they need to. Hey, so this is old black and white. It reminds me of the chariots of fire, but uh, the, uh, I mean, that's a good, a good example of a couple rigid levers there. And, and uh, rigid levers do, I mean, you think of horse hooves, um, you tend to be fast if you've got rigid levers. So one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, well, what is, what does a normal foot look like? And uh, um, this picture actually kind of gives a, a nice illustration of, of, of what I see a lot that walks into the clinic and, and actually what, what an orthotic can do underneath a foot um, and how it, it helps improve the alignment. Um, and this is, that's really just one of, one of the goals of an orthotic is to help a foot do what it's not doing very well on its own. There's things really need to line up. A normal foot or an ideal alignment is the lower leg and the, uh, the rear foot or the heel should line up as it does here. The, the heel should be perpendicular to the ground. And that's the, se the second thing. The third thing then is the rear foot and the forefoot, the heel and the toes, they also should line up. And we'll see variations in that too where the, that, that alignment is, is not correct. And then our toes, number one, and two and through five should also line up, and we'll see variations in that that can cause problems. So that's really what a normal foot should look like. I almost never see one. Um, w w this is what's really interesting and fascinating for me is, is that it's just amazing the myriad ways that humans get around this planet and what, what we're walking on. And, and all of you in this room probably have some variation of normal to some degree or another. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to see a train wreck and, and you know, people are fine. They don't hurt. And so that broad range of normal is really broad. So the next question a lot of people ask me, well, what kind of foot do I have? And this is a very simple test that really kind of an oversimplified way to help you identify, well, do I, have a, do I have a loose bag of bones or do I have a stiff high arch foot? And this is what they call the wet towel test. You take a paper towel, you lay it on the floor, and you take a wet foot, you maybe step on a wet towel, and then walk across that paper towel. And you'll leave a track. The water off your foot will go on to the, uh, the paper towel, and you'll you'll see an outline there, a damp outline on a paper towel. And you may be Fred Flintstone. Uh, you may have you know, somewhat of a normal foot where you see things neck down. There's a, there's a little bit of contact, but not much. Or you may have a very high arch foot that really, there's only parts of your foot that ever touch the earth. You might hit the heel and the toes, and then you're gone. And when you turn your foot and you look at the bottom of your foot, you'll see nice pink flesh that has never touched the earth. And uh, so, so let me, the question that I get asked a, a lot then too is, well, okay, what brand of shoes do you recommend? And the the challenge is, well, I mean, 50 years ago, I mean, you know, Rich and I, we got we had a choice as long as it was. Chuck Taylor's, we had a choice. We had a choice of one, and this is what we wore to school, and we wore for basketball season, and we wore, we wore our basketball shoes after basketball season to school. Next, and then we got a new pair the next fall. Um, but now there's the, the, the shoe line and the shoe industry is just metamorphosed, metamorphosed into what it is today, and, and, and I really can't point to a shoe brand and say, you know, this is better than that. Yes? Could you project a little bit more? Sure. I'm a basketball coach, and I've got four kids at home. I don't have a problem being hurt. <laughs> so, no, I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you. So, the, um, almost any shoe brand and any shoe company now makes the whole gamut from, you know, really, 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 soft and floppy to really, really, really stiff and rigid. And so they're really, you know, whether it's Asics or New Balance or Nike or uh, whatever, you, you still have to evaluate every shoe on its own to determine, well, is this, is this Asics the right Asics for me? Um, and just a little quick little, these are just some fun pictures, a little, little history. 
10,000 years ago, we decided shoes were probably a good idea, uh, just for protection from the environment. And uh, they've evolved in all manner of oddities over the dec over the, the centuries. And and I actually I think the, I think these I can't remember where I got this picture, but I think these are Elton John's. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks like they could be Elton John's shoes. So um, and uh, the Victorian shoe, of course, you know, got to have a good set of cowboy boots if you're going to live in the Northwest. Um, so there's the you know the Chuck Taylors, the, the Converse All Star that the, have been around for decades, and I, it still warms my heart to uh, uh, to see a pair on kids today. It's, it's they're nostalgic, and but uh, they are good for business. Um, <laughs> I really credit Nike though for or blame Nike even uh, for revolutionizing the shoe industry. And it, it's. Uh, um, uh, the, the problem I have with Nike, though, is they quite literally sold their soul for fashion. And, and they, they made shoes that sold. They didn't necessarily make shoes that perform well. Um, it's the other shoe companies that have forced Nike now to start engineering better uh, performing footwear in all sports and in all activities. Um, you'll hear this term, uh, motion control. And you go to, if you go to uh, the, the shoe store and you, you tell, ask the clerk, say, well, you know, I've, I've had some shin splint pain, and I, I, what kind of shoes do you think I should get? Oh, you should get a motion control shoe. Here, let's get you in this, and it's $110, and there you go. I'll ring you up up front. And this, this term motion control, uh, it was coined back in the 80s. I'm not quite sure where it came from, but... It, it was sort of the beginning of this notion that shoes should do better than just protect us from the environment. They should help our feet um, in, in shock absorbing and transforming for a rigid lever, um, especially if we uh, um, um, have too much motion in our foot and our foot collapses and our arch collapses, and then a shoe actually can help with that. Um, so. So, well, how do you know? What's a shoe? You know, how are they put together? And, and what makes the difference between a shoe that's really floppy and a shoe that's really stiff? And I think it's really important to know even just a few basic fundamentals of how shoes are put together. Um, the, uh, and with that, I want to start to to show you sort of even just at a glance, you'll see, um, you know, the difference in integrity of a shoe. This is essentially a moccasin, a lace-up moccasin. You will fold it up, put it in your pocket, and go to the gym. Um, and this shoe is going to let your foot do whatever it darn well pleases. Uh, and so um, shoe companies, though, in the modern era of the shoes, they started making them out of a little more modern materials. Um, there's, there's two quick tests you need to do to be able to, to differentiate uh, and, and identify sort of how shoes are put together and how, how they function differently. But this, this midsole, this section right here, this is really uh, this part of the shoe that contributes a lot to its integrity. And this particular shoe is just this white EVA foam. It's just soft, it's squishy, it's great for shock absorption. Uh, you'll think you're running on pillows. Um, what this does not do very good is it's not very stiff. And, um, and in about six months, 500 miles or so, it loses about 50% of its resiliency. This is, what, this is where this notion of you need to change, you know, buy new shoes every six months, especially running shoes, it, is that this, this material loses its resiliency very quickly. I'm going to start passing these around. Um, and there's a couple things that I want you to do to the shoe. Grab it by the, so every shoe that comes by you, grab it by the heel, grab it by the toe, and bend it. And see where the shoe bends. That shoe hinges right in the middle of the shoe. Your foot does not hinge there. That's not where your foot's supposed to bend. Your foot should bend at the toe box. That's where your toes bend. And so if you have a shoe that bends in the middle, um, it's going to really try to force your foot to bend in the middle. And that's not going to feel very good. So. And then you come to me and say, Ed, something's not right. <laughs> so, 
Um, and it's actually kind of funny. I, I mean, I, I have these sitting over here. I had a patient that came to me with foot pain. And she, she had the gall to wear these to the clinic. And she's like, yeah, my, my shins really hurt. And I'm like, you don't say. <laughs> and I, I said, do you have another pair of shoes with you? She said, well, I have another pair of shoes in her car. And I said, good, go get them, because these are mine. You don't get these. And I, I took them away from her. And she looked at me like, you can't do that. It's like, well, they're, they're not worth anything. So Smithsonian, maybe. But, but anyway, the, um, the other thing I want you to look at um, is, is I want you to lift the sock liner up. Uh, that's, that's what you know, goes on the inside. And some people call it an insole. It's, it, it really is just a sock liner. Um, and lift it up and look at the inside underneath this. And uh, you'll see a, a couple different types as they come by. And some are more flexible and some are more rigid. Some also have a different shape. And this helps match your foot to, to the shoe. And we'll go over that in just a second. So every shoe that comes by, you bend it and you twist it. And you'll see a real broad range of integrity to each shoe. We'll just start with this guy here. So, so then, it, yeah, as the shoes come by, then look at the, look at the, uh, uh, the midsole. This is the outsole, the tread. And the outsoles have all manner of variations. I mean, just, and for the most part, it's really just design and gimmicks and, and, and uh, you know, they'll change this every few months. The new model of the shoe will come out, and they just give it a different outsole. I mean, just really, just for pretty colors and swoops and swirls and lights and flashing things. And so, the, uh, so anyway, we'll pass that one around. To, uh, to make a shoe, uh, let's see. Okay, to, so this is a little information, and this is in your handout, by the way, so. To make a shoe a little stiffer, you'll start seeing what we call foot bridges. They're these little plastic pieces, and you'll see, again, all manner of designs, and, 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 um, and some are really big and obtrusive, and some are just small little pieces of plastic. But it starts to make a shoe stiffer. It's more resistant to torsion, and, and it starts to, to make the shoe stiffer up to the toe box so that when you load that shoe, it's more inclined to bend at the toe box. Um, you really load this shoe, though, you're st or maybe even three months after you've started wearing it, now it starts to, to collapse. But start to appreciate the differences. They start getting stiffer. As we go down the line, the next advancement or I guess progression towards a motion control shoe is a, sh a shoe that starts to, you see a, a darker gray midsole or at least a section of it that's darker gray and that's what we call a dual density midsole. It's got the white and soft stuff but now it's got a little section here that's a little stiffer and a little harder. And that makes the shoe a little stiffer and a little less forgiving. And so if your foot is really good at shock absorbing, but it's not very good at being a rigid lever, this dual density midsole starts making the shoe stiffer. So that it can, for, for uh, propulsion, for push off. Go ahead. Yeah. Do most of the problems come from the shock absorbing? Like if your foot's really flexible, is it the shock absorbing that's the problem or the pushing off, the lever part? Um, I'd say most people have um, shock absorbing problems. Now you can have shock absorbing problems because of two reasons. If your foot is really a loose bag of bones and you really are flat footed, and uh, um, then that's a shock that's kind of already bottomed out. Uh, now they just, you know, it's like running in swim fins. You're just, you just bang, bang, you know, you just flop, 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 flop. And so you can really have, um, have a uh, shock absorbing problems from a foot that's too loose, or you can have shock absorbing problems from a foot that is really too stiff. And, and so some of those folks, they need, they need cushion and shock absorption, but if they're really pronated, they're gonna, they've bottomed out, 
they hit, they flatten out, and they never stiffen up, and they never have a, a, uh, a transform to a rigid lever. So for those people, they need shock absorption at the heel, but they need a stiff midsole so that they can impact load and then have a rigid lever for push off. So that's where it starts getting tricky. Um, the heel counter, you'll notice in the Chuck Taylor that went by, the heel counter is this piece that really sort of tries to cup your rear foot. And the Chuck Taylor has a little piece of cardboard, itty bitty little piece, and that's their attempt at a heel counter. And you can actually kind of fold it over. There's just not much integrity. So your, the, your rear foot is going to kind of do whatever it wants to do in this shoe, too. May as well be wearing a flip flop. Um, but of these shoes that are coming by you, then you'll start to feel that man, there's a little more integrity there. They can be made out of hard plastic. And, and really cup your heel. Uh, that's just another uh, element of the shoe that helps control that foot and, and the motion that it, al it allows. So. Some of them are too cut, though, and it wears through the fabric. Yeah, and you know, some of these, you'll see, gosh, they're really padded. I mean, it's really a, col they call it a collar, um, and it comes up and tight around your Achilles. If your shoe is poorly fitting and your your with every stride, your heel pistons up and down in there. You'll blister back here. and um, Or if you wear an orthotic, sometimes it jacks your foot up too high, and you rub here, and it's really annoying. And some people are just funny. Some people's foot shape is just, they'll have a, a heel that really kicks out there a long way. So, I mean, um, and uh, th those are difficult to, to find, too. Some of those people, like uh, the real stiff, um, uh, heel counters like in a dance co. Sometimes that people will blister. They'll develop, if, especially if you have a pump bump. Uh, that'll become red and inflamed and annoying. So uh, the heel counter can be as, as much of an annoyance as a help if it, if you don't have a good fit. Is there any part of the sole that just kind of stops you from rolling that way as you take off? Over the right, and, and that may be more of a function of what your foot is trying to do. And you have to be careful if you put a, you know, that, uh, put in a shoe that really takes away motion, something that naturally is how you want to roll off. People that tend to be a little bit uh, pigeon-toed, they tend to roll off and push off of number five uh, rather than number one. And uh, there really isn't um, a shoe that will affect that. Um, we really go to the foot and try to change how that foot is functioning. So that's a great question. No one's ever asked that before. So you're free to go. So, no more questions like that. The, uh, that's great. Um, so the bend test and the twist test. Okay, so yeah, this one's stiffer than that one and so on and so forth. Uh, one more thing as we keep going here. The uh, with this shoe, when you lift up the insole that's coming around, you'll see it's got cardboard in there. That's the last, the, the last of the shoe. And that's what the part of the shoe that actually gives it its shape. Uh, years ago, they would make the, the leather last was what the rest of the shoe was built around. And when you go to uh, have a custom pair of shoes made, they, they, they take a tracing of your foot, and they cut that last, and then your shoe then is going to be built around that. And so that's the, that cardboard last is actually stiffer than the fabric or felt ones that you've seen previously. And so that's another element inside the shoe that makes that shoe stiffer and less uh, forgiving. And I got to tell you, though, the shoe companies have gone to the extreme, like they always will. Boy, if this one sold well, well let's make one a little stiffer. And let's, let's make, this is the, um, the Saucony brand uh, or model of, of the Brooks Beast. Some of you have heard of the Brooks Beast. And it's, I have taken these shoes away from more people than I've recommended them for. Um, and, and actually what I tell people to do with this shoe is build a deck with it because it is a, it is hard as a rock. And it is just, um, 
Actually, the only people that I recommend that shoe for is, is folks that are really overweight and they have to work on their feet for a living. They, they're a security guard or they just, they're on their feet and they're standing a lot because they need a shoe that won't break down uh, just because of the, the loads. But that's, um, I, uh, I've taken that shoe away from more runners than, than anything. So a stiff shoe, who needs a stiff shoe? Uh, if you have a supinated foot or a high arch stiff foot, um, then then you should have a, a more of a cushioned flexible shoe. You want a shoe then that will give you more shock absorption and be more forgiving. If you put a stiff foot in a stiff shoe and run on a hard surface, that's a bad combination. Okay, 15 more miles. And and then you know by mile 10 you're running on bloody stumps. So the um, but. The um, a pronated foot or a flat foot or a really loose foot needs to have a shoe that's more stiff and more forgiving, or, or more s stiff and more supported. The um, and so you know what I'm. I've got a couple models actually. I'll send these around just for you to take a look at and just. It's just a mo plastic model with a cutaway. Then and, and this is a, of course a real high arched foot. Um, and some of these may look familiar. You may think, yeah, yeah, this is me. Um, and then I've got one that is that is really flat and collapsed. And you know, this isn't a. It's not a bad thing to have a flat foot. I mean, we have entire um, um, uh, races of people, entire regions of the planet that have flat feet. Go to the island of Samoa. You won't find an arch on the whole island. And that's, that's okay. That's how they're put together. It's, uh, you know, in Pacific Rim, uh, in Native American, a a Asian, Pacific Islander, um, they tend to have uh, what we call a low calcaneal angle. The, the bony anatomy of their foot is, is flatter. If you're of Germanic descent, you're probably going to have a little higher arch foot. That's, that's normal. So anyway. Um, so common questions that I get asked a lot about specific kinds of shoes. Um, the Birkenstocks. Well, what do you think of Birkenstocks? I like Birkenstocks. I don't own a pair, but uh, that's not because they're not a good shoe. They tend to have a very contoured footbed. They, uh, the cork is relatively stiff. Uh, they're fairly supportive. Um, and uh, I have only really have one negative thing that tends to bother people a lot is the heel sits pretty low. And a lot of people tend to have Achilles tendonitis. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the thing I really like about them is you can't ever get rid of them. You can get them resold and reconditioned and own them forever. Um, so the, uh, so I, I'm all, Birkenstocks are OK. The uh, Crocs. I've, I've heard them called Crocs or Cripplers. Uh, it it kind of depends on which camp you're in. But uh, the, the thing that I do like about Crocs, they're extruded foam. They're going to be very good at shock absorbing. The other thing is they're, they have a real contoured footbed. Uh, and so that'll give you know, marginal support, pretty, pretty decent support to, to people for a while. Um, there's certainly a lot of room in the toe box. Some people have a real hard time getting into other shoes because they're, they're they have a kind of a fat foot, or they have a, 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 a just a wide foot, and so the Crocs will accommodate that. The um, they do tend to wear out fast. Again, that that loses its resiliency, especially if you're a nurse and you're walking on concrete all day long. Six months, four months, buy them two pair at a time. Um, uh, because you're going to go through them. And most, most people I find, they just try to wear them too long. So, um, and dance goes. How many people in this room wear dance goes? Yeah. They, um, I recommend dance goes a lot for, for a, a, a lot of different uh, afflictions. Um, they do have sort of an undercut heel and a, a um, almost a rocker bottom uh, shoe. And, and, and for people that have arthritic ankles or fused ankles, or um, um, they tend to do pretty well with with that 
that even though they're very hard, they have kind of a rock. They're almost like a uh, what do they wear in Holland? Clogs. The clog, yeah. So the wooden clog. All right. So that's what they are, I guess. So the um, uh, and so people tend to do pretty well um, in dance goes. And boy, have they expanded their product line. Good, good businessmen they are. Um, <coughs> crap or cream? <laughs> it's hard to hard to tell the difference sometimes between crap and cream. Um, and, and probably over the last couple years, this is probably the single most question that I that I get asked is, "What do you think of the minimalist shoes and the minimalist footwear?" Um, um, rage is back, and uh, um, I, which is great for me. Again, it's good for business. Um, the uh, it fits me as better as a glove than it does as a shoe. The it's okay. I mean, minimalist a minimalist shoe is a I mean, you know again we don't have to wear shoes, and uh, so anything that is a you know a flip flop is a minimalist shoe, um, a moccasin and. Uh, you know the Nike Free. Uh, I mean, every shoe company now is on the bandwagon. Every shoe company makes a minimalist shoe, and and uh, really a minimalist shoe is just a shoe that doesn't do very much. It just protects you from thorns and rocks, and and rocks not very well. But if I was going to go camping or boating or you know even just work in the yard. I would wear these. I wouldn't wear them in public because I think they're hideous. But that's that's just me. But so you know, bend it and twist it, and that'll give you an idea of what a minimalist shoe feels like compared to these other shoes that are going around. And about two billion people don't have shoes. Yeah. They go barefoot. My understanding is there's less foot pathology in that population. There's there's there's. Two possible explanations for, for that, Rich, um, and I think probably both are true. A is if if you are not putting your shoe or your foot in this shoe from age six on, your foot muscles you have three layers of muscles on the bottom of your feet. Not to mention the muscles of the, of the calf and lower leg that have to do their job, and, and so your feet can get lazy in these things. Because the foot's going to do what you, or the shoe's going to do for your foot what it should be doing on its own. And so there's this this idea that that um, when you're barefoot all the time, those foot muscles have to do their job. The other element is foot pain just may be so prevalent and just an element of <laughs> that they don't complain about it because yeah they always hurt. Um, everyone's hurt. But I think the bigger issue though, Rich, is that that when we decided to pave the planet, that's when it became an issue. Um, we can go barefoot all summer long, but we don't run 20 miles on pavement uh, and do that at the same time. And I can, because I wear shoes all day long, I can hardly take the trash out without a pair of shoes. Now my feet are so tender, and uh, and so I'm like this out in the driveway. But um, and so if I was going to put you know 20 miles a week on. I better change how I run too. Um, so the 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 Skechers, of course, Skechers got in a lot of trouble for making the shape ups. You know, they tone your butt while you just stand there, and that's uh, the the uh, that doesn't work. And uh, the sketcher had, was forced to stop making that claim. And uh, but I, I still actually, uh, I, again, for people that have rheumatoid arthritis, for uh, people that have fused ankles, because of the rocker bottom and the cushion and this this heavy layer of foam, um, the, the people do pretty well in that. When historically it was the three hundred dollar black orthopedic, awful looking grandma shoe, that that was the only choice people had. And so now they're, those are those are the people that I recommend this shoe for. Um, yeah. Any other other any uh, questions regarding shoes? Um, oh. Let me back up just a sec before we get to the orthotics. The um, cost. Well, how much should I pay for a 
good pair of shoes. There is no correlation between price and quality, or price and durability, or price and flexibility or motion control. Um, if you go to Sport Town and talk to Joel, Joel's about as knowledgeable about shoes as anyone in the Quad Cities. Um, you're going to pay a premium for his shoes because he has the current model of that ASICS or the current model of that uh, Nike or what have you. And that's, that's where Joel's business lies. You go to Big Five or uh, Tri-State, you're going to find last year's or two or three years ago's model. And so they'll be a little bit discounted. Um, this is, this is a, an old example, but it's still relevant. My wife runs you know, 10, 15 miles a week and has for years. And we went on vacation, and, and uh, this was years ago when I went on vacation. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, um, um, anyway, she left her running shoes at home, and she wanted to go for a run, and, and, but she didn't want to go buy a new pair of shoes. Her shoes were at home. And so we went to... Uh, Pay less shoes at Shopco, and uh, she runs in a very you know uh, at th this was years ago a low end New Balance, but it was you know fairly stiff, had decent integrity, and this is I stole this from her. This was after you know four or five hundred miles, and I was like okay, and so I went to Pay Less and I found a shoe. It's like okay, fairly stiff, got a little got a little footbridge there, good EVA foam, good shock absorption. And uh, it's like fairly, and so how about these? And she says, well, they're, they're not hideous. I'll take them. They were $12. She did great. And she kept running in these for uh, four or 500 miles before she got another pair of, of New Balance. But 12 bucks. So don't feel like you need to pay 112 bucks just to get a pair of shoes. So it, it, it just depends on, you know, every, it doesn't, whatever shoe you pick up. It's got to pass the test. So, um, basketball shoes. My children, God bless them. They weren't aware that I, I really have sort of a deep burning hatred towards Nike. And uh, <laughs> one, year, one year for Father's Day, this was several years ago, one year for Father's Day they bought me a pair of basketball shoes. And I tried to wear them. And, and they didn't know. Um, but this is... So, and uh, gosh, I had the most raging case of plantar fasciitis I've ever had in my life uh, from this pair of Nikes, and I just finally just couldn't wear them anymore. I, I just had to go get a pair of Adidas, and, and uh, uh, you know, they would just, just stand the test. And so whether it's a basketball shoe or a football cleat or a, a soccer shoe, the, the same rules, even an everyday men's dress shoe or women's dress shoe, a loafer, can pass the same test. So... Yeah. What about leather versus, you know, not. Like a lot of women's shoes are not leather. Yeah. The, the uppers, it doesn't really matter whether it's synthetic or, or, or leather. The, um, um, you'll, and you'll see like your, your flat there. It may be leather, but you can, you know, wad it up and put it in your pocket. So um, that's really more a question of breathability, durability, um, looks and so price. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good so far? Okay. Um, so one of the next questions I get asked a lot is, well, do I need orthotics? And uh, I, I tell you, I see some amazing orthotics. Um, this was a mid-40s gentleman who I've known for a long time, and he kept asking me. I'd say over a two-year period, Ed, I need to come see and get some new orthotics. Said, okay, you know, you know where I work. Finally, he showed up one day, and he had these orthotics already. He just wanted a new pair. He had had these since high school. <laughs> well, I know one thing. You don't get to wear those home. Those are, we need to cover those in diesel and set fire to them. But the... Uh, um, can you ima imagine the smell? It's all I'm asking to you to just imagine what they smelled like. So, yeah. 
This is another or orthotic that a woman wore in. She had her pair of custom orthotics that she had had made for her somewhere along the line. Somewhere she decided she had a leg length discrepancy and she started shoving things under her shoe. There's a, uh, this is about a 5 uh, uh heel lift, a leather heel lift, and then some door shims. Um, so th these are on top of my desk now too. I confiscated those too. The, those were in her shoe. That's what she stepped on every step she took. And I had to, she had no leg length discrepancy. Um, she had profound <laughs> hip weakness. And now she, because her hip muscles were so weak, she kind of walked like this. And she thought she had a leg length discrepancy. No, Dr. Jacobson made sure your legs were the same length when he replaced your total hip. What we really need to do is do the strengthening. And so I begged her to let me have these. We, I said, just give me two weeks. And now she walks normally, and she realizes she doesn't need those. So, but yeah, it's crazy. Can you imagine what your back would feel like walking on that every day? So, with orthotics, I, I do make orthotics and have for years. But I would say, out of ten people that get sent to me to for for orthotic management, I probably actually make a pair, make two pair. Uh, for, the, for out of 10 people. And I really try to keep people out of them. Um, I mean, for, for me, it's kind of like some people can get by with dime store reading glasses. And some people, some people really do need prescription eyewear. And, and OK, so that you get that. Um, but uh, uh, with, with a lot of people, they just need their feet to do their job again. So let's do the exercises. Let's get those muscles strong so that your feet, and, and some people just have no awareness of what's going on below the knees. They just are just walking on chunks of wood. They don't know what their feet are doing. They don't even know where they're at in space. Um, and so sometimes it's just a matter of just reconnecting with what those feet should be doing and training them to do their job. And they do fine. Um, some people then just need matched with the right shoe for that foot and that they're happy. They don't need orthotics. They just need the right shoe. Sometimes the, the exercise, the right shoe, and maybe an over-the-counter, you know, just a little arch cushion uh, to help with a little extra shock absorption or to help you maintain that arch, and they do fine. It's really just those last couple that, you know, back to those alignments. They really just have a bony alignment problem. And, I mean, it's either wear an orthotic or go to Les Schwab and get a front-end alignment. And, and uh, this is so... Some people do need orthotics, and, and they, they do OK. But I really try to keep people out of them. Because you're saying that you need this with every, every time your foot hits the ground and every pair of shoes you wear, and that's, that's tough. Should everyone run? Yes. It's good for business. <laughs> Have you ever seen a movie, Run, Fat Boy, Run? And so I just feel like that movie was about me. But the... Um, the, uh, and there's, here's your shoes, Rich. Um, so, Ed, are you going to make a comment about earth shoes? Earth shoes. Gosh, er, early 70s, mid 70s? Help me remember, Rich. They were wavy on the. Yeah, you always felt like you were falling downhill. I think a few people need an orthopedic surgery after you. Yeah. Well, and this is what's great about, you know, um, it was something that might start out as a good notion, and it, it ends up getting extrapolated and, and made into something that really just ends up being good for business. Um, there's all manner of gimmicks and variations out there that just have no, you know, no real basis of... They were referred to as negative heel because the heel was on the front part of the foot. Wow. And all the surgeons thought they were great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this too shall pass. And those are two liter bottles squished. Yeah, yeah. You just need protection. For, for, those are a Nike. Um, <laughs> those uh, <laughs> There are some zero drop shoes. Is yeah. I mean, if you're doing long-distance running, is, is that something that would help you, having that zero Yeah, that, that's another thing. That's, um, a fairly recent um, gimmick, if you will, that's showing up in the shoe industry. And that's what you'll see with, uh, with these 
with these shoes, they're thicker at the heel than they are at the toe. And again, it's sort of a, sort of help you sort of roll off the toe. And it's also this notion that that you need if you need shock absorption, let's put it back here at the heel where you heel strike. Well, when you look at how people run, some people are heavy heel strikers, some people are midfoot strikers, some people run on their toes. And, and even a person who heel strikes, the vertical loading forces are highest at push off here. And so you're passing more force up the chain at the toe. And so they've, they've started making shoes now that are a little, what they call a zero drop, or a, what, uh, what was the other term you used? Um, heel drop? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, they're, they're kind of equally thick all the way to the toe. The problem is, if, if that's not how you load, then you might have problems. Uh, um, it's great that they increase the shock absorption in the foam at the front, but, but you've also now you've kind of dropped the heel a little bit. And I tend to see people with Achilles tendon problems. Uh, because now they're now it's like they're running in their Birkenstocks and their heels are on a little bit of a stretch now when they uh, more so than they would be normally, and th the thing is though is it, they're good if you're a midfoot striker if when you're running you kind of there's not much heel strike there and you're you're midfoot striker then they didn't tend to do pretty well with that. Uh, Almost all of these things, and back to the minimalist foot, footwear too, the human body has an amazing ability to adapt. And as long as you start slow, back off your mileage, give your body a chance to get used to that shoe, the mechanics are going to change, how you run is going to change, and, uh, and start low and slow and see if you like that and see if your body will adapt to that um, before you just start to you know, strap them on and go for eight. Um, and then you, know, you call a cab to get home. That's bad. So, um, but that, that is, this, this is, uh, th that shoe was born out of this notion of you should not heel strike, you should be a midfoot striker. So, yeah. So, running sucks. Really, I hate running. Mm -hmm. and we talked about my preference for exercise. But walking, sometimes walking shoes don't look the same as running shoes. Is there a difference when we're, we're thinking we want to walk more in terms of the type of shoe we should buy, or does it matter? I didn't mean to stump you like my Right. What is the difference between that and the market? You know, I think it's probably more of a difference in who that market is. Um, if you go and look at, uh, I'm trying to think of this, the, the brand that will pop into my head as soon as we stop. But uh, say Mr. and Mrs. Retired Couple wants to walk at the mall uh, or walk at Beasley or whatever. That shoe's going to look a little different. It's going to be tan. It's going to be, you know, a, mm, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of that. But a uh, if you're Joe Average bag of donuts and walk, run, or jog, there's not much difference in. And, and even if you're Mr. and Mrs. Retired couple, and that's what you want to do, you just want to walk at the mall with each other and put in your mile or two or whatever. This those shoes still should do the same thing. They need to shock absorb. They need to have some rigidity up to the toe box. Um, and so they still need to perform the same way. They just will look different. Rockport, is that what you were thinking? Yeah, yes. Rockport, they make a walking shoe. Um, there's a couple others too. Um, I can't pull it up. So. Um, what about high heels, Ed? Man. <laughs> Bad all surgeon's dream. Yeah. They, uh, yeah, they do. They make your legs look fabulous. Even yours, Rich. They, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, there's all kinds of problems that are inherent with it. And really, it just depends on how, mo how much you're on your feet. But the, uh, you know, toe box problems and, and uh, uh, stress fractures in the, in the forefoot and, you know, what we'll do for fashion. So wearing heels often, that will, will it change your arch? Will it change your arch? Um, yes. In, in, in a couple other adaptive changes. So if you're in a pump or a you know, two-inch heel every day, a couple things can happen then too. Your Achilles tendon can start to get adaptively short. So that now when you are barefoot or you do wear your Birkenstocks, now your Achilles is getting strained because it's not used to it. 
Yeah. You might. Um, and yeah. So there's a lot of adaptive changes. If when you're in, the, your just feet aren't used to it. now they're now the heels dropped. So yeah. Change the shape of your foot. What if you want to have a higher arch, or you want to have more flexibility? You can retrain it, and that, that's what that's what we do. Is we show you, okay, this is what you got to do every morning when you're brushing your teeth. I want you to try to stand like a stork and try to create a little arch there, and get get those muscles used to um, uh, maintaining that arch. And you 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 have to learn that what that new position for that foot feels like, because otherwise we're just hanging our ligaments. And, uh, and so you, we have control over it, most of us. Um, and so you can retrain that foot to function in a new position, just like we do the rest of our posture. So. Yes, the, the problem with a fallen arch is ligamentously your foot has given up the ghost. So now you've lost the ligamentous support to even to help you. So you're really relying exclusively on the muscles. Typically, if you don't have a shoe that'll support that or an insole that'll support that, your muscles just fatigue out. They need help. And then by definition, an orthotic guides and supports motion. So, um, and, and that's really what we want the orthotic to do. So that would be one place where I thought yep. a customer costs. Yeah. And I, what's really interesting is, is uh, and I saw one th earlier this week, a 21-year-old female had one fallen arch. Uh, she on one side. She had a beautiful foot on one side and Fred Flintstone on the other. When she was 14, she stomped on a water bottle. She felt something pop, and, uh, um, and she actually fractured a sesamoid bone in her foot. But ever since that time, she had one flat foot. She had ruptured the spring ligament and. And now here she is trying to, to run and perform and, you know, do higher level stuff. And, and she's going to need an orthotic on one side. She's going to get two so she has a match set so she's not jacked up. But the, the other one will just be a neutral, you know, uh, uh, I'm not trying to do anything with the other one. But, so. What if your arch is too high and run on the outside? Um, yeah, that's, and we see that. And, and uh, you'll see... Fibula, fibula stress fractures, fifth ray stress fractures. Um, that's a foot we got to try to mobilize. We got to try to get that foot to, because it's just like, and we got to try to get you to move um, and create motion where that foot is not used to having motion. S stretch it out, mobilize it, show you how to stretch it at home, and put you in a cushioned shoe um, so that to, to minimize the impact loading. Um, but actually, if that's that you? These are barns. Yes. Right. Um, the, some of the European uh, brand shoes are really, I'm a big fan of those. Um, I think the, is it the Bond or Macy's that carries Bourne's? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I send a lot of folks that way. Yeah. So anything else? Other others? Yeah. So the cushion for the shoe, um, so should you get shoes every couple of years or every at year? least okay. right you tell your husband i said so <laughs> yeah um, and uh, well you just you know very infrequently you know check the integrity of them check the wear pattern um and and you'll start to see and you'll start seeing other people's shoes that are starting to get crushed uh on one side and and they won't give up on them and it's like let go of them. They've served their purpose well. Um, and go shoe shopping. Yeah, yeah. Shannon. Do you think for kids, too, like they go in on a shoe so fast and so we just to... Yeah. Kids, period, really don't need shoes at all until they're ambulatory outside. So when they're two and they're running around all summer long, they might need a little protection just so you know, from rocks and slivers. Um, exactly. Children really don't even start to form an arch until they're about eight years old. They all have flat feet. So they're mostly cartilage down there. And, uh, um, but they do need and don't spend a lot of money on kids' shoes because they're going to be out of them before they wear them out. So um, they just need to be proper fitting. They need to be cute or cool and, um, and affordable. Um, but they don't need a lot of structure and support and 
Chuck Taylors are generally fine till about eight and beyond, then they might start needing a little. Yeah, that's yeah, that's growth and development and kinesthetic awareness and yeah, normal strength and conditioning. We need that. So, great question. Yeah. What about the wave shoes? Oh, the Reeboks, Mizuno. Yeah, um, they're all foam. Kind of like the Nike Free, so it's all it's all about cushion, and so that's all that shoe does. Now th you might see some you know variations and model changes and evolution to where, yeah, it's cushion, but hey, that ain't bad. All right, as long as it's got some integrity, because that's what it what that wave does is shock absorb, um, and for an everyday shoe, the, you know it's probably okay. Um, the Nike shocks, you know, the ones that have the springs in them, um, generally okay for an everyday shoe, but you won't find a runner that likes running in them because they do, sh they shock you. Um, they're, and, and think about it, if you, a size 11 guy's shock, Nike shock, um, or a size 8 women's Nike shock, you might be a female that weighs 190 pounds and wears size 8. You might be a female that weighs 125 pounds and wears a size 8. Well, how you're able to compress the springs in that shoe are going to be very different. Uh, but Nike doesn't care. That's a size 8. It gets this heavy of a spring. And so um, you may not, you, if you're smaller, you may not be able to compress those springs and you're getting pounded with every step you take. Anything else? Thank you so much. If, uh, please feel free to email me questions, concerns, issues, specifics. Um, I'd rather, yeah, I'd rather see you up here than down at the clinic. So, <laughs> thank you.